And let me go ahead and share my screen. There we go. Father, are we, uh, the slides coming through okay? Yep. Very good, okay. So I'm Paul McLaughlin. I've been a parishioner at St. Patrick's for the last two years. And as Father mentioned, I do work for Honeywell. My role there as chief engineer is to look after uh, our process control systems. These are the computer systems that manufacture very critical uh, materials and critical processes like oil and gas, um, pulp and paper, uh, wastewater treatment, food and pharmaceuticals, things like that. And of course, cybersecurity is a critical element uh, along with safety and reliability. Uh, it's one of our bedrock principles to ensure that we have continuous well operating systems. So on uh, the occasion of this Memorial Day, I would like to Welcome everyone to uh, this presentation. As we go through it, um, do feel free to ask questions. If you want to put them in the chat window, we'll take a look at that as we go through. Uh, we'll also leave some time at the end. So as Father mentioned, uh, there are quite a lot of headlines every day. There's a new headline about cybersecurity breaches both large and small, um, it affecting individuals, affecting corporations, the government, uh, you name it. There's just a few here, like the uh, recent um, attack on the Colonial Pipeline, which has driven up gas prices that you've seen. But it's, uh, it is quite a, uh, and I'm sure you all know, since you're here listening tonight, you, it's a very critical topic for, uh, for us as individuals. Our goals for the session, I've really laid out three. One, to have an increased awareness of safe computing. Um, the second one is to have practical guidelines for you to protect yourself and your family. And the third is to give you some resources for further information to increase your knowledge and awareness of cybersecurity. So I'll list uh, a lot of sources for material as we go through. Uh, most of them or all of them really readily accessible to you. I will try to avoid um, unnecessary jargon. The computer industry is chock full of a lot of uh, terms that seem arcane and bizarre and I'll try to avoid that or when I do need to use one, I'll try to define it. So our agenda for talking about cybersecurity is really threefold as well. So clearly cybersecurity is, is a key topic, but in the broad brush sense of cybersecurity, there's a lot of other things to worry about. Of course, data privacy, your data and your privacy is critically important. And third, technology beyond personal computers and smartphones. What does it really mean? What's it doing? How's it helping or hurting us and things like that? That's also an aspect of security that we'll talk about. <clears throat> so we'll start with cybersecurity itself. And uh, ideally, I'll lay out some good tips for uh, uh, computer and internet security. Really, they're inseparable, by the way. Computer, cyber, internet, and so forth. Cellular communications, it's all rolled into a, a necessary hygiene for good practice. I want to start by defining a few key terms, if I could. You've heard and seen these terms. Um, so we'll start with cybersecurity itself. So the word cyber, if you're wondering where that came from, there was a seminal work done by Norbert Wiener in 1948 referring to cybernetics, um, in which he described electromechanical systems which could approximate and improve human activity. It also anticipated the field of artificial intelligence. Again, this is, this is back in 1948, which is only two years after here in, the, in Philadelphia, the ENIAC uh, computer was first introduced at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he had a couple of really important books that he wrote, uh, one called Cybernetics or Control and Communication in the Animal and Machine, 
Uh, and he also had a very interesting book in 1950 called The Human Use of Human Beings. I recommend both books if you have the time to, to look at those. So that's where the term cyber comes from. And of course, it really just means now computer or internet or cyberspace or anything dealing with digital technology. Cyber crime, of course, that's the bad stuff that people do in a criminal behavior. Malware, malware is a portmanteau of two words, malicious and software. So malware is just malicious software. The, um, and we'll, we'll talk a lot about that. <clears throat> Man in the middle attack, that is a very, uh, important type of cyber attack where you will find someone will impersonate or silently participate in a two-way conversation and perhaps manipulate the message between the two parties in a malicious way or in a way to steal information, things like that. In uh, the field I'm in, in process control, a man in the middle attack would be something that might spoof the automation system itself and cause it to take uh, incorrect action on the manufacturing process. So it's a very important term for us. Botnet. So again, bot is short for robot, as you can imagine. And a botnet is a network of computers aggregated together and infected with malicious software. And they act as a group to do something um, of a malicious nature. So they might, for example, act to send a lot of spam email messages out to you, or they might participate in something called a denial of service attack. And the worst kinds of denial of service attacks are uh, distributed denial of service, also DDoS. Um, and what they might do is they might try to take down government computers, or they might take, try to take down Netflix or Amazon or someone that, you know, they, they just go after um, for, you know, sometimes for no reason, no financial gain, they just go after uh, an agency that they don't like. So botnets are when your computer and other devices have been hijacked to participate in an aggregate with a lot of other group computers to do something malicious. Phishing, well, so this is a very important term. There's a related term called spear phishing, but phishing in general is where you will get an email and it might have an embedded malware program or a link and it looks fine to you. It looks like, oh, I'm getting an email from uh, my sister or uh, my partner. Um, it could come from your employer and it looks legitimate and it may be designed to reveal personal information or to infect the device or you know, several other things. So uh, a lot of times criminals use phishing to go after your bank account. Um, so you'll see a lot of phishing emails that come that look like they're coming from your credit card company, for example. And then the, the emails will say, click on this link because your security is not up to date. We need you to do something. Well, what that's going to do is not take that link and take you to your credit card company, but maybe take you to their web address. And from there, they'll ask you to enter your password and your account number and all these horrible things. And then they'll take control of uh, maybe your bank account or your, your uh, credit card. So phishing is one of those things we have to really pay attention to. We'll talk a bit more about that. Ransomware. Well, that was what the Colonial Pipeline attack was. So um, they infected the Colonial Pipeline computers, which managed the flow of the gasoline and with malware. And in doing so, they were able to, you know, basically cripple that operation. And until the owner and operator of that pipeline paid a ransom to get the malicious software out of there, um, they wouldn't release control of the of the pipeline. So this is happening more and more. By the way, often the ransom is paid in cryptocurrency, like uh, Bitcoin or something, because those types of currencies are not traceable. 
So there's an intersection between some of these other technology activities you see in the news, like cryptocurrency and you know, malicious acts like ransomware. Identity theft and spoofing. Well, the reason we still get emails um, that spoof a real person or agency is because people continue to fall for it. I saw a recent example. Uh, you're familiar with uh, Mackenzie Bezos, uh, Jeff Bezos's uh, spouse, and she intends to give away her portion of her fortune that she gained through uh, her work and her marriage with Jeff Bezos at Amazon. And so she's been working globally to find legitimate ways to distribute her wealth, which is a good thing. However, people are exploiting that now by sending emails that look like they come from Mackenzie Bezos's foundation. And there are almost an up, uh, a modern, uh, I, I say modern, nothing in cyberspace is really that old, but they uh, look like an update on the um, African prince emails where you're asked to send some bank account information and then you'll, they'll transfer millions of dollars from this country into your bank account. Well, the same thing here. There have been people who've been affected uh, by fake emails using Mackenzie Bezos' good name to uh, appear that they're uh, reaching out to distribute money, but in fact, they're looking to uh, steal money from your own accounts. A rootkit is a especially nasty form of malware. A rootkit actually attacks the fundamental operating system of the computer itself. And once you have a rootkit, there's really nothing you could do. You can't get rid of the virus. An antivirus program can't remove a rootkit. You, all you can really do is reinstall uh, what we call from bare metal. You have to reinstall all your programs and your operating system uh, from a clean machine to get rid of the thing. So a rootkit is especially nasty. Now, what it does is it may do things like um, do botnets or it may look for information on your computer and try to steal and things, but um, pretty nasty thing. I'm sure you've all seen examples of two-factor or multi-factor authentication. This is certainly getting more popular. The, people realize that password protection itself is not sufficient to guard against um, cyber attacks. And so, for example, you may go on to your um, online to look at your bank account. And what the bank will then do is send you a separate code using an SMS message to your cell phone that you would then enter because they know your, what your phone number is because you've given them that information. And so you're actually authenticating yourself two different ways, one through the password and the other through um, proof that you are in possession of your phone and that you can enter the special code they send you. It doesn't offer perfect security and does require this extra step, but it does make your data more secure online. I will mention though, bank apps on your phone um, they aren't necessarily two-factor because when you call up the app on your phone, the same passcode or biometric you use to open that app may be the same one you unlocked your phone. So that's really just a single-factor authentication. A two-factor is two independent mechanisms to verify uh, your authenticity. And finally, we come to the dark web. Uh, you've probably heard that term. The dark web is that World Wide Web content that exists on what are called dark nets. They're parts of the network, the internet, that require maybe special software or configurations or authorization to access. They're not, um, they're not discovered through uh, typical World Wide Web search engines, which do something called crawling the internet to find information and websites and things, and then they, they bring them up uh, like in Google pages and things. These things don't appear in Google searches. Um, the dark web is part of something larger called the deep web. Again, something not indexed by web search engines, but it's really nasty stuff. Uh, my tip for the dark web or the deep web is don't go there. Just, just don't go there. It's used by cyber criminals, 
real criminals, it's used for illegal transactions, child pornography, really nasty stuff. So stay away from the dark web. I certainly stay away from the dark web, no interest in that. So uh, now we'll talk a little bit about um, some common mistakes uh, and omissions people might make. And we all do it, so don't worry about these. I mean, this is, this is what we do. Um, you know, we're human and we make mistakes. So one of the most simple uh, mistakes is a failure to update our systems um, when we're requested to. And this could refer to antivirus uh, software or definition files to make the antivirus recognize new viruses. It could be operating system updates like your iPhone uh, operating system called iOS. It could be your Windows operating system on your personal computer um, or the iOS that's on your Mac, those sorts of things. Uh, it could be application software updates. If you're using Microsoft Office, for example, that will publish updates. And generally, the, the computers have gotten a lot better uh, because of cybersecurity threats than they used to be. And so they will automatically update unless you turn that off. And I don't recommend you do. Generally, automatic update is, is a good thing to do and to keep active. So you generally don't have to do much to make this happen, but where there is an update that you have to actively, um, uh, like a, an iPhone update, you wanna do that as uh, soon as you can. Another common mistake is to ignore you have someone in the waiting room, there you go. Another uh, key mistake is to ignore warnings. So Chrome uh, from Google, the browser, and Microsoft Edge, which are placed in the Explorer, they're much better now at alerting you to possible vulnerabilities. They'll actually pop up um, caution windows to ask you, are you really wanna do this? Be very, very careful to ignore those warnings. You don't really wanna ignore a warning unless you're absolutely certain that what you're doing, the site you're visiting uh, is a legitimate one. Poor password hygiene. There's many common mistakes here. Um, some are just that the password is too simple. It may be a word-based password and therefore it might be easily uh, uncovered through what's called a brute force dictionary attack. That's where the, uh, uh, you know, the malicious computer will just try a whole bunch of different passwords by using words in the dictionary. More sophisticated though is if you use a password based on some personal information, some personal data like birthdays and pet names like the cartoon here has. Um, that's also a common mistake. You generally want to use passwords that are not in any way um, legitimate words that can be found. Another example, uh, maybe you probably thought about, but I'll point it out here anyway, is to share a password. And that's especially true if you use it on multiple accounts. In general, you don't ever want to use a password for multiple distinct accounts like your bank or your streaming service for um, television, things like that. Um, and what can happen, for example, if you do use a password and you share it, like if you have a Netflix account and you share that password and account credentials with your children or with others so they can also use your Netflix account, well, now you've given away a password that may be used for more critical things like your credit cards or your bank and things like that. Another common mistake is to not have frequent password updates. You don't want to keep the same password for any length of time. Generally, I mean, it's recommended that you update your password every month. Um, that's hard to do. It takes a lot of discipline to do that, especially if it's a website or an application you use infrequently, but it is recommended that you update your passwords. And some, as you know, many sites will force you to update your password after a certain amount of time has passed. And of course, the classic password mistake is to just write it down on a post-it note and leave it close to your computer. And you'd be surprised how often that still happens. So the recommendation here for password hygiene is to get a password manager or use some other secure mechanism with encryption and so forth to keep and log your passwords. One example that uh, uh, was recommended to me by one of our Honeywell cybersecurity experts is called LastPass. One word, last pass. Um, you, can, you can Google that and that's a, a fairly simple password uh, minder for you. 
Clicking on websites. So this is where phishing comes in. So clicking on websites from email is, of course, um, one of the classic ways to uh, have people infiltrate your computer. Um, just be careful. Now, there are some tips for this, too. You can just use your mouse and hover over what looks like a legitimate website, and it will actually show you the, the actual uh, uniform resource locator or URL code that is the actual physical address on the internet. And if it looks bad, it probably is. So don't, generally you do not wanna click on a link directly in an email. Perhaps you may wanna uh, use your mouse, copy the link and paste it in a browser and take a look at it. And then the browser can give you some extra protection to see if it's, uh, if it's a, uh, something you shouldn't go to. But in general, don't ever click on a link in an email. Um, uh, USB memory sticks, uh, universal serial bus, that's what USB stands for. Those things uh, are very common ways to uh, infiltrate your computer by having viruses um, embedded within the, uh, the memory of that stick. And what happens is when it gets activated by plugging it in to your computer, um, there's an executable file on that memory stick which runs and then its job is to load a virus into your computer. Uh, some companies like Honeywell, for example, we disable our USB access. So if you stick one of these virus uh, memory sticks into your USB port on a computer, uh, nothing happens because we won't allow it to be uh, active. And then finally, um, public networks and devices like going to Starbucks, for example, and using your computer. Be very, very careful here. Those Wi-Fi networks are not secure and they can be eavesdropped. So you may be um, inadvertently sharing information you don't want to share. Uh, again, especially if you're doing something very sensitive. Now, there are ways around that. If you use a public Wi-Fi network, then it's recommended to use a virtual private network or a VPN. And a VPN um, overlays the network communications and provides a level of encryption and security so that you're not actually putting information out on the public Wi-Fi. Okay. So we'll go to our next slide here. And of course, you know, why does phishing work? So we've talked a little bit about this uh, exploit where people uh, click on links and give, give away information. It works because they don't need everyone to do it. They just need a few people. Generally, phishing is a broad-based attack on many, many people, um, and if especially like to corporations and companies and organizations and so forth. And they get one person, they may be able to then infiltrate that computer network, that company's computer network, and then through rootkits and other malware, um, spread out through many different computers. So it's unfortunate, but it does work, and. Uh, Again, we need to be ever more vigilant against this one. Uh, some of the familiar types of phishing attacks, um, I can speak from personal experience. You might get an email from a family member or a friend. Maybe it's not someone you've talked to recently, but they're very familiar to you. And they say that they're in another city and they wanna fly back, but they, they had their wallet stolen, they lost their credit cards, they have to buy, buy a plane ticket. Could you buy it for them? That's a very common phishing attack. Another one is someone says, oh, um, I've got a niece who has a birthday coming up and I need to get her some iTunes gift cards. Could you buy them for me? Cause I don't have my wallet handy or something like that. It sounds a little bit suspicious, but you know the person it's coming from. But in fact, it really isn't because they're spoofing someone in this phishing attack. Um, another classic is you get an email from your bank. And it has all the right credentials and it looks like your bank and they've got the splash screen in the email and um, now they're asking for some personal information. Never ever respond to an email from anyone with personal information because uh, that's a classic phishing attack. It used to be these phishing attacks were very easy to spot because they had misspellings and bad grammar and just just very coarse mistakes. The problem now is they are way more sophisticated than they ever used to be. So it's very hard to spot a fake email. 
So the watchword on this one is if you're not sure, don't trust it. Even if it's from your employer, if it's from your employer and they're asking you, for example, to do a survey or something, well, go and check with your HR department. Did this really come from you? And you're really asking us to do this because it looks like a cyber attack. And trust me, your employer will be happy that you're being that vigilant to make sure that you don't do anything to harm the corporate network. Let me just pause for a moment here before going on to this next, uh, this next section here that I've uh, called up from Consumer Reports. Do we have any um, questions or comments so far as the pace uh, Okay for everyone. Yeah, Paul. Yes. Please go ahead. Oh, I think he froze. I think that's a uh, bad internet connection. From my end. No, I can hear. I can hear you fine. Okay, you froze for a second there, Dad. But I think we're good now. You could try it again. Okay, Paul. Yes. Uh, so far, I mean, everything is very, very, very interesting, and so forth. I, uh, I've, I've already got questions, uh, you know, buzzing through my head here. Um, when you talk about one of the things you talked about was unsecure public Wi-Fi. Yes, we just got off. We just got off a road trip, and uh, I use public uh, Wi-Fi at airports and hotels. Yes, it, they secure. You know, it's a, yeah, there. I guess this public. Kind of I'm sorry. Sorry, your, your connection is not, not fully stable, so we didn't get the whole question there. I think your question was um, in that we do use public Wi-Fi all the time for our business travel or personal travel in hotels, um, at airports. My, my guidance here is simply it's best not to trust it. So don't do anything sensitive on it. Um, if you're using a uh, computer that was provided to you by your employer, um, ideally they made sure that that computer has some extra protection built into it to screen out bad websites and things like that. Also, generally employers provided computers now have uh, disks which are encrypted and other general communication is done encrypted and things like that. But um, if you are using public Wi-Fi and you have a virtual private network, a VPN, use the VPN, turn it on immediately and do everything through that. Mm -hmm. And that way you'll be sure what you're doing then is basically making a public Wi-Fi a private Wi-Fi. Well, what I, what I was going to say is I only use the public Wi-Fi things to connect for playing games and uh, or, or accessing Facebook, uh, things like that which I don't see that there's any threat personally. I would not do any bank transactions, uh, anything like that, well, using public Wi-Fi, certainly not. But if, if, if the insecured situation, if, if I'm doing things like just playing games, internet mm -hmm. games, that, uh, you know, the games that require the internet, <clears throat> say for instance, poker, yeah. uh, <clears throat> where you're playing other people online, I don't, and, and, and this is not for money. This is just place, play mm -hmm. stuff. Right. Uh, you know, if, I, if I'm accessing Facebook, I don't, I don't care if somebody uh, sees that. Uh, is, is that. Is that maybe not a wise? Well, again, it's a gray area because let me point out, as soon as you connect your computer to the public Wi-Fi, if there is a malicious actor active on that Wi-Fi network, they can start probing your computer, even if you don't oh, do anything. Oh, <laughs> remotely. They can remotely yeah. get into your computer. I see. Yeah. So, so what, what, I, what I'm doing can be, can be completely innocent 
what they're doing is not. Yeah, that's right. And I have no control over that. That's right. So, you know, when I travel to certain countries around the world, um, I assume as soon as I put my computer or my phone on that country's network, <clears throat> it's something is going to start probing to pull information off of it, company secrets, things like that. And so the first thing I do is connect to a virtual private network back in the United States so that my computer acts as if it has a secure channel to the United States and it can't be probed by you know, mm -hmm. that other country. So mm -hmm. the best advice I can give you is um, use a VPN if you're using a public network. That's what I would do. Um, mm -hmm. Or use a device that doesn't have anything on it that you're um, unwilling to lose. So mm -hmm. yeah. sometimes what we'll do is we'll take a computer that's been cleaned out of anything sensitive, proprietary, and so forth. And we'll just use that as a, 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 a machine to be able to do basic services like, you know, download a boarding pass and things like that. Okay, one, one other quick question. Say, when I turn on my cell phone, mm -hmm. I've, I've, got a, I've got a password to get into my cell phone. And I don't, I don't change that password. I mean, it's, it's, uh, um, it, it's, it's a, it's a date that's, it's an anniversary date that's, that's, that I can easily remember. And it's just turning on the cell phone. And, and you're suggesting that you change that monthly? Just, um, just access your, your cell phone? Uh, it, again, it's a recommended practice that you, change your authentication access to your cell phone, like your iPhone or your Android device um, on a frequent basis. Maybe not monthly, but um, for example, at my company, we'll, we're forced to change our access passwords to our iPhones every three months. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Sure. So let's, this next slide here, I'm still in part one, um, but in part one, again, this is the main you know, thrust of our discussion on cybersecurity. So this issue of Consumer Reports came out uh, February of this year. It's excellent. It, it's a great, um, really readable, uh, as Consumer Reports always is with you in mind. And is, it has four key areas, keeping the bad guys out, guarding against viruses and malware, um, recognizing that stuff will break or get lost. Uh, and also very important, making sure your own home network uh, can't be hacked. Something we often overlook because, you know, up till now we talked about phones and PCs, but uh, your home Wi-Fi network is critically important to keep that safe. Um, so some really great examples of guidelines here, keeping the bad guys out, you know, password manager, multi-factor authentication, like we talked about, how to avoid phishing scams. Um, we talked about keeping software updated. There's some opt-in things you can do by changing security and privacy filters to make them even more rigorous. Uh, they're worth looking at. This one we haven't talked about, um, a failed computer. It happens all the time. Your computer will die and it'll take whatever data is on it with it for the most part. Now there's ways to um, improve that. For example, a lot of computers now have what are called uh, solid state drives. Basically the hard drive is not a rotating disc. It's, a, it's basically electronic chips. They're much less likely to fail because there's no moving parts. A rotating disc, the typical hard drive um, that computers up to this point always had, they will fail because they are, you know, very, very fast spinning disks. And you think of like a record player and getting scratches on your records and things. So very, very important that you recognize that whatever data you have on your computer, you could lose it if the computer itself fails or the hard disk fails. So back your stuff up. Now, where do you back it up to? Well, obviously you back it up to some other device um, you might have a, uh, an external hard drive that you use. I use um, solid state uh, external hard drives. I also am somewhat um, concerned about losing data. So I have multiple 
external hard drives I back up to, and then I keep them in different locations. I might have one uh, here at my house in Philadelphia. I might keep one in my office at work. I do that because it isn't just that the device might fail or get lost or stolen. It could also be you could have a fire or some other, you know, wood or damage or something that destroys the device. And there's also ways to back up your data using the cloud. There's a lot of uh, very inexpensive cloud services. Apple has it, Microsoft has it. Um, and so you can back up a lot of your data uh, securely uh, in the cloud. Uh, and Apple and Microsoft, uh, I do recommend, they both have very secure cloud services for storing a lot of data. But they're not perfect either. So I, I think a balance uh, is in order. So let me talk a little bit about this last one here, hacking proof your, uh, your home network, because this is important. You, um, since you're all uh, joining us tonight, probably from the comfort of your homes using your own home network, which I'm sure involves some sort of router connected to uh, like a Verizon Fios system or a Comcast network or some other cable provider, or maybe you're using a, a cellular hotspot which converts to Wi-Fi. Um, I'm guessing a lot of you are using Wi-Fi tonight. And there's secure Wi-Fi and there's insecure. Even if it's your own private network, you want to make sure that you've got security turned on on your Wi-Fi network. A couple of simple things I like to do. There's a, um, the name of your Wi-Fi network uh, comes as a default when you get the router from your provider. I always recommend you change that to some name that's meaningful to you. It doesn't have to be an encrypted name or a, um, a, like a password. It just has to be a name that you recognize. Um, that, uh, that's called an SSID or a service set identifier. So that's when you join a Wi-Fi network. That's the name that the network identifies itself as. I also recommend that you change the setting for that SSID to be non-broadcasted. By default, that, that network name is going to be broadcasted so it's easy for you to find it and connect to. But what I actually recommend is you go into your router settings and make it non-broadcast. That will prevent people from sniffing your Wi-Fi and trying to hack into it. Because if they can't see it, they, they can't get into it. Um, there was a movie many years ago uh, with a young Matthew Broderick called War Games. And he did something called, back in this movie, War Dialing. This is when computers were accessed through computer modems and dial-up service. And so he basically you dial a bunch of phone numbers to try to find a, uh, an access point to a computer network. And then when you find it, you try to hack into it. That term's since been changed to war driving. And what that is, is that's people driving around in cars with Wi-Fi sniffing equipment to find your Wi-Fi network and then attach to it. Sometimes it's not malicious intent. They just need a Wi-Fi hotspot because they want to get on the internet but it could be malicious. And one thing I wanna point out is um, the address of your computer that you use at home is one of a, a set of addresses that are basically private addresses, but they link to the, the gateway address that you're provided by your internet service. That address is the endpoint for your home. It's that address that if someone's doing something illegal uh, or nefarious using your home network by hacking into it, the FBI will trace that to your home. That's as far as they can come. They'll see, okay, so it's this, this address at this location is doing this nasty stuff. Let's go there and seize all their computers. You didn't do anything, but someone hacked into your network and did some bad stuff and it brought the feds down on you. So uh, I don't want to scare anyone. I just want it's very, very important that you take security for your home network very, very seriously. There's other ways to make it more secure too. If you're, um, one of the best ways is there's something called uh, Mac filtering uh, medium uh, address content. The Mac address um, is a unique string for every device and you can write into your router uh, authentication for only a specific set of devices, your devices, to be able to be accessing your internet. 
if you do that, then you have very, very good security because nobody with a different device with a different MAC address can use your internet address. So anyway, um, this issue of concern reports, especially if you get concern reports, really, really good. Um, also some good tips here from the Leahy Center um, at, uh, in Vermont, Le Ch uh, Champlain College. Um, a few additional things you may not have thought of. Turn off Bluetooth on your mobile device unless you need it. Unfortunately, it's getting more and more needed, like it's used on my Apple Watch here. So uh, if I don't have Bluetooth on my watch and my phone won't connect. But if you don't need Bluetooth, it's best to turn it off because uh, people will try to, Bluetooth isn't that secure, and people will try to use it to go into your phone and pull out information. That's how they're always getting pictures off of uh, celebrities' phones and posting them to the internet. Another tip is don't auto connect to Wi-Fi. So there's settings in your phone as to whether or not you have to be asked to join a network. Do that so that your phone isn't automatically connecting to perhaps a suspicious network. Don't leave a device unattended or unlocked um, because if you do, someone could get to it and put in some malware or even worse things. They might, um, like if you're at work, and you walk away from your desk and you have a coworker that uh, doesn't like you for some reason, they might walk over to your computer and spoof you, make, you know, send an email to someone else as if it's from you because it came from your computer. And you can imagine some nasty things that could, could ensue from that. So again, this, uh, this website here, Lay College, that has some very good um, uh, tips. And then there's many additional resources that you can use. Um, I've listed just a, a, a couple here, uh, uh, the uh, Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, a government agency, uh, as you can see here. They have a lot of really good information. Um, the cipher.com, likewise, some really good information, including things like check your online accounts regularly, your bank accounts, uh, your credit reports, your credit card statements, credit card charges, things like that. What you're doing then maybe once a week, go in and check these accounts. And you're gonna lay down a baseline of what you expect to see. And then if you go in there and you see something really divergent from what you expected, you know something has happened. So it's best, especially since you know, many of us now have so much of our you know, bank and credit and so forth online, it's important that we vigorously check those things to make sure that uh, no one's gotten into those things. I'll also point out, this is in the cybersecurity thing, but the credit card, debit card thing, um, something I always you know, tell our kids, don't use a debit card for anything other than withdrawing cash in an ATM because credit cards by, by the US government have a lot of protection on them meaning if there's a fraudulent charge, you're not responsible for it. The credit card company will, will fight that. And more importantly, you're not out any money on a credit card until you um, choose to pay it. Whereas a debit card, that money gets pulled out of your account right away and you have to fight to get it back. Okay, so here's you know a few other uh, CISA and cipher.com and Manhattan tech support. You can Google those and find some other great information. Okay, I wouldn't be complete here if I didn't mention something that I feel very strongly about. And I think Dante is a special level of hell for people who prey on the elderly. But um, there are vulnerable people in our society, elderly and others, uh, that are especially susceptible to some of the exploits that we talked about, these phishing attacks and behavioral attacks and consumer fraud and identity theft. These are, these are nasty, nasty things. Uh, and it's critically important that um, we continue to work to improve our, 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 our basic technology so it is secure by default and things like that. But it's also important to have educational uh, resources out there that help people um, understand the risks they have with their with their money and and uh, you know other aspects of their privacy and there are studies that have been done that show that um, um, 
for whatever reason, older adults will have twice the likelihood of becoming a victim of phishing attacks compared to younger adults. They've done those studies. Um, why is that? Well, it could be that you know, younger adults grew up, the so-called millennial generation grew up with computers and they're more familiar with them. Or it could just be that um, older people tend to be more trusting or they may, um, you know, they might be lonely, things like that. So um, again, this is, this is an area of, of great concern to me. Okay, so now, oops, get back here. So now we're going on to part two, data privacy. Um, so these last two sections will go a little bit, uh, a little more brisk. But I did want to touch on them uh, briefly. Um, so tips about social media, either you know, don't use it, <laughs> or if you're like 70% of the US population you do use it, um, use it with, an awareness that anything you can put out there will be read by anyone forever. It never goes away. So just assume that. Just assume it'll be seen by everyone. Your online material is going to be seen by employers. It's going to be seen by school admissions officers. It's going to be seen by the police, by the government, your spouse, your friends, your family, your priest, everyone. Just assume that. And that'll be a good guideline for deciding, should I post this? The top five social media mistakes include, and this is a cybersecurity thing, sharing personally, identif personally identifiable information. We've talked about that, but it can include things like email address, driver's license, social security, bank card, credit uh, account numbers, things like that, passport numbers. Now there are legitimate online services where this information may be needed if you're at requesting a visa to a foreign country, they're going to ask for your passport number. There, you just need to be certain that the website you're working with is the real website from that government, and it's not a spoofed website. So I can't advise that you never put this information out online because you may have to. You just have to be very careful to make sure that you're talking to uh, the agency you think you're talking to. And it's hard to know because it's not like talking to a human. You can't see and feel and touch them. They're just a bunch of cyber data on a screen. So be very careful. Geotagging. So that's a term. It's like when you take a picture with your iPhone, uh, it will include metadata with that picture. Obviously things like time that it was taken, time and date and so forth, but it also includes the location where you took it. And if you post that information and make it available, that can be a very dangerous practice because by sharing that photo in real time as you take it, that's letting strangers possibly know where you are at that moment. That means people that you don't know might come up and try to spoof you and meet you. They might try to detain you or do worse things. Also, remember, if you're posting information about not being home, perhaps being away on vacation or traveling, what, what you're telling the bad guys is, there's nobody home, go ahead and break in, steal whatever you want, because there's no one there to stop you. So be very careful about information you harmlessly or seemingly harmlessly post uh, in social media because it, it can cause you some trouble. Um, not locking down privacy settings, that's pretty straightforward. Don't accept friend requests from people you don't know because now you're letting them into your personal information that you wanna keep private. Um, quizzes and games, um, you know, we just talked about the poker game. Those things are great uh, um, Trojans for malware uh, and other uh, exploits to get into your computer or just to be able to get privacy information. I'm sure you've all seen um, quizzes and questionnaires and things to tell you know, you know, who's your ideal mate and all these kinds of strange things. And they ask you a bunch of questions about yourself. What they're really doing is slowly gathering a lot of information about you. And what they're gonna do with that is they're gonna aggregate that plus inf other information they find out about you somewhere else like school records and somewhere else, you know, employment records. And they can build a whole identity about you and use it for identity theft. So be very careful with those things. 
Likewise, these uh, online memes and games, again, they're also uh, notorious for uh, pulling information about you, aggregating it to a large data set, and then uh, exploiting it. A couple words here about work and your use of computers at work, especially your employer's um, provided equipment. Just again, assume that everything you do on your work computer or on your work network um, can be read or seen by your employer. They can see all the websites you visit. They can turn that information over to the police if they have to. So by recommendation with uh, work resources, computers, phones, et cetera, or when you're on a computer network at work, or even with your own personal equipment, my recommendation is only do things which are truly work related. Now, interestingly, we're talking tonight, this computer I'm using is my work computer, but that's part of the Honeywell's outreach to the community so that we, the employees, uh, work within our communities to try to um, share uh, information that might be useful or do other good things that can help the community. So this is a legitimate use uh, of computer equipment from my employer. Uh, and I'm certainly not sharing anything that I would uh, not tell them directly. So now we'll move on to part three. So here, we're gonna talk about technology itself. I'll do this fairly briefly because we're a bit, we're closing in on, on the top of the hour. We've talked about personal computers and smartphones. Well, let's look at some other technologies as well. As well. So let's start with some key questions. So a couple of books I read recently, I found very, very useful. One was called A World Without Email and another was called Digital Minimalism, um, written by Cal Newport. I really recommend these books. Um, they really give you some probing, insightful thoughts about technology. Is it helping us? Is it hurting us? Uh, you know, what, how's it changing our behaviors and our perspectives, things like that. So I've written down just a few key questions to think about um, with regards to technology. Is it making us happier? Is it making us more productive? Might it be making us more stressed or anxious? Is it making us safer and healthier and more secure? Is it giving us more free time or is it in fact stealing time from us as we support all this technology? Is it gonna be obsolete? Look at cell phones, for example, and how frequently they come out with a new model every year and expect you to once again, shell out money to have you know, three lenses on your camera instead of one, so forth. Planned obsolescence is, is a huge part of consumer goods. And so is it really helping you save money? Is it money well spent? And those sorts of things. So you always wanna go in looking at technology, eyes wide open and, and really ask yourself, is this going to you know, really do for me what I expect it to? And there's so many good online resources now that give you ratings and insight onto different types of technology. It's worth reading those before you invest in anything or use it. So uh, Consumer Reports again had a great um, uh, article in their January 2021 issue about smart home technologies and how these can really help uh, improve your home. And they can, but I also list some concerns with them. So some of the key themes, spousal abuse. And I don't mean um, specifically physical abuse here, more mental and, and emotional abuse. But for example, there have been unfortunately a number of cases where um, because the smart home allows uh, a person to do things remotely, use cameras, change the uh, heating set point, or maybe change the combination for a cyber lock on the front door, people are doing some really nasty things with this technology. So that's a major theme we have to watch out for. Elder care would be an uh, uh, equal example. These things are, can be technically difficult to understand. They can also present memory concerns. Like if you have to remember a passcode to get into your home instead of just using a physical key, that might be a challenge for some people. And remember, these devices can be hacked. 
they have as a default, a manufacturer password built into them. All of them, if you buy a smart TV, um, that manufacturer of that TV has put in some default credentials for uh, how that um, device can be set up. And if you don't change that, um, cyber criminals can, can use that to get into your device. And remember, like a smart TV, it's a computer. It, it has a microprocessor and it has, it's, you know, it's basically a computer hooked to a high definition uh, video console. That's all it is. And it can be hacked just like any other computer. And also finally, of course, things work until they don't. <laughs> so you've all, I'm sure, have situations where you've been working fine with something and all of a sudden it doesn't work and you have absolutely no idea why it stopped working. is isn't necessarily a cybersecurity thing, but it is a cyber topic. So for anything you wanna get, go through each, look at the pluses and minuses. So smart doorbells are great. You know, they give you more security. They're great for deliveries. But like I said, they could be abused. Smart thermostats, great for energy savings, great for home comfort, but they can be hacked. Now, what does a hack of a, a smart thermostat look like? Does that mean someone's gonna sneak in and change your temperature setting? No, but they might go in and look at your profile as to uh, when you have the thermostat go into a I'm not home mode, you know, some sort of uh, echo mode. Uh, and that can give information you don't want to share about yourself to someone about, well, uh, this person is at work from eight to five, therefore that's a good time to go rob the house. Smart locks, like I said, you know, really good for, um, you know, keyless entry, like on your car is a very convenient feature. It also allows for certain monitoring of who's coming and going. But again, if you have a hard time remembering the codes and things, um, or if it gets hacked, you may be exposing your house to a breach. Um, vacuums, pretty convenient, but they don't do a great job and they've had problems with pets. Smart TVs, as I mentioned, have some great features, but they can be turned into, um, uh, aggregated into a botnet, for example. That, that's ha that has happened, that, that's a real exploit. Uh, by the way, these are all real exploits and these aren't theoreticals. These are things that uh, have happened over the years. Leak detection systems, um, these are great for, uh, for your water supply so that they auto shut off if they detect a leak. That's mostly a good thing. Uh, there may be a case where you might have a false positive, like you know, if, if someone's in the shower, then someone turns on the garden hose, maybe it'll appear to be a leak and it shuts off the water and there you are standing in the shower, but that's, that's not too bad. Smart garage openers, they're very good. Um, they're great if you have kids, you need to let them in remotely. Um, but they're complex to set up and they're expensive. Sprinklers also good um, for water conservation. They're generally better than just pre-programmed sprinkler systems that run whether it's raining or not. Uh, but again, there's complexity issues. Lighting, again, very good convenience, but it takes some uh, effort to get those things working. Security cameras, um, they do give you security and they do give you safety, but again, they can be hacked. Um, you know, we had the case with Lower Marion where the video on the uh, school district supplied computers were being activated remotely by an admin for the school district. And uh, they were looking at, you know, into people's homes, into uh, the children's bedrooms and things like that. Um, Do-it-yourself security systems are great, but again, um, especially they're much lower cost than uh, going through uh, someone else to set it up and uh, the monthly costs and so forth. But it may give you a false sense of security if it really isn't set up well. And then smart speakers like Alexa, uh, they give you a lot of convenience, but again, they eavesdrop. And you know, we've, we've had cases where uh, people say things and it causes the smart speaker to think it's asking you to uh, connect with someone else and then someone else is listening to your conversation. Maybe you don't want them to. So again, there's a lot of really good strengths to this emergent technology and how it can make your life easier. But again, eyes wide open, there are downsides. And of course, technology fails. Um, <laughs> you've all seen articles about Zoom fails. Hopefully we haven't had any on this call, but uh, where you show or say things that you didn't really want to show or say. Um, there's an over-reliance on technology. Um, uh, you know, 
you'll see people in the airport in the boarding area waiting to board the plane and they've got their smartphone and that has the boarding pass and the battery dies or they don't have an internet connection they didn't put it in their digital wallet and now they can't get on the plane so it's a good idea have a paper backup likewise if you're traveling somewhere google maps are great and they'll give you real-time traffic and all that kind of stuff but at least know where you're in general where you're going so if your phone dies or there's no cell coverage well, at least you can more or less get there the old fashioned way. So a lot of these ideas on technology fails are, don't be overly dependent on technology because it will fail. Um, and so it's good to uh, also practice things that you knew from before you had all this great new technology. And of course, one of the great technology fails is autocorrect fails. <laughs> I like this one especially. Um, and this, you, you, I'm sure we've all done this, I, but you can, if you want, turn your autocorrect feature off in your phone by going to the settings, the general tab, and then the keyboard and turning it off and you won't get these pesky issues. Some other issues that uh, we've all seen, you know, the device won't sync, the device is offline, the phone won't pair with whatever you're trying to pair it with, a smart speaker or a smart watch, something like that. Um, you're gonna have people over and you need the technology to work and no matter what you do, it's not working. Um, another uh, typical tech issue, mobile might have a dead battery. So if your mobile, you know, mobile phones do go dead. So what does that mean? Does that mean something that you're dependent on with that? Like a, a cyber lock no longer works. So how do you get in your house? Things like that. Um, and in general, the stuff just doesn't work and you don't have any idea why. And, um you know it's it's just driving you crazy so that goes under the category of thinking about you know is the technology really there helping you or not is it making you more secure is it making you happier safer it can it absolutely can just like i said eyes wide open okay so that's that's what i have for you tonight so with that um we're unfortunately we're over time it's a big topic as i'm sure you all know but um uh, if, if you want to stay on, we can certainly take a few questions now. Yeah, Paul, this, this is a fascinating presentation. It's uh, very, very well done. And thank you so much for doing it. Uh, sure. You know, occasionally I, I get things on my phone, like we all do, that, that I've won a, a contest. And the contest will be under the, the letterhead of a... Uh, let's say a, a Costco or something. Right. Or a FedEx or, or some other corporation. It will have the logos on there and everything else. And, and then they're gonna, they're, they're, you have to open a link or something to find out more information. Now, what you're saying is that you can't really trust anything today, anything at all. It'd be wiser to, to distrust it than, than, than it would be to trust it. Maybe it is legitimate. Maybe I, I, that I actually won uh, a new car or something, but uh, the, uh, I, I guess what you have to, you, to, to, to err on the side of caution, I guess you, you just have to not go there, right? Well, or as Reagan said, trust but verify. Um, so if you have a way of verifying it really did come from who you think it did, um, that may be okay. But of course, the other, you know, cliche here is, uh, you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch or if it sounds right. to be true, it probably is. Th those rules still hold. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. <laughs> so no, you know, no one's giving away stuff, uh, especially if you didn't enter the contest explicitly. So, and even if you did be a spoof. So yeah, you you, um, you you just need to verify those things, especially if they're looking to get some information or some money from you. Never, you know, if you get an email asking you for money, never send money. That's that's always a fish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Especially credit cards. Uh, I mean, gift cards. Um, I you know we have a smart TV and we have a vast. Um, security system, and I bought an Omni and pick, hooked that up to the rotor, uh, to the, the yeah. router, mm -hmm. and I was surprised that I get these um, 
text messages that say that you just, you know, they've just blocked a security hack on your TV. And it, it was really a surprise to see those. So I was glad that we did that. Yeah. Again, this is, as I was mentioning earlier, the, the technology is getting better at detecting and preventing uh, breaches. However, it tends to always be one step behind. The criminals are always, you know, they know what the um, cyber protection is and they find ways to go around it. And um, until the antivirus program or TVs are especially bad because they don't get firmware updates very often. Um, you actually have to go into your smart TV and demand a firmware update to get the latest security patches and things. It's not like a Microsoft PC or a Apple phone. So yeah, those, those are, uh, um, I generally will, like with my smart TVs, uh, limit them down to just basic uh, features. So instead of, for example, using the Wi-Fi on the TV, I'll use a, um, uh, an Amazon Fire Stick, which has a lot more protection than the TV does. And also, you know, Amazon does a good job of updating their devices with patches all the time. So there's, there's ways to you know, get the good quality TV experience, but not have the security issues. Well, I noticed a few questions and comments in the chat. Okay, I, let's see if I can see the chat now. I, unfortunately, yeah, I needed that third screen <laughs> to see the chat and the, and the people and the- uh, Actually, it might- all that stuff, But let me call that up now. It might be helpful to stop sharing screen now too. Uh, yeah. It might actually be easier to access the chat. Yep, I'm gonna do that, stop share. And now I got the chat back, okay. So let's go through these. Where does one get a, VC, a VCN for use in public place or a VPN, virtual private network? Um, you can, you can. they're available through reputable agencies. Uh, so if your company has one, great, but you can also buy VPNs services through um, a variety of, of agencies that sell them to you. Um, I don't have any to recommend offhand. I use my Honeywell VPN, but um, they are uh, available to uh, buy on a monthly basis. Um, let's see, could I describe more of the request for iTunes gift cards? I've had that happen to me. Yes, that, that's a, it looks so legitimate. Um, and, uh, and it comes from uh, an email address that looks perfect. And even if you go and um, inspect the, uh, uh, the email um, header file, it looks like it's coming from the person who sent it, but it's just written so oddly, like this person would never ask me for money. Why are they asking me to buy iTunes gift cards instead of just doing it themselves? So it, it, all you're really doing in that case is just realize that, look, no one's going to ask you through email to go buy a bunch of iTunes gift cards or, uh, you know, Amazon um, services or anything like that. Just assume it's a fish. Um, yep, backups are a great way to recover from a ransomware attack. In fact, like on my home computers, I don't have any personal data on the hard drive at all. I just have programs and I keep all the data on external hard drives that can be disconnected. Now they can still be hacked by a, a ransomware, but I'll have duplicates of that in other uh, external drives. So yeah, absolutely good point that um, if you do have a ransomware attack and they want to extort you for a whole bunch of money, just tell them no, go ahead and blow away the computer because I'm just going to reinstall everything and you know, let's get the FBI after you guys. Um, question, so I should not be going to FedEx for the flash drive to print out a document since I don't have a printer. No, that's okay because that's your flash drive. You know it's secure. You're going to give it to FedEx. FedEx is pretty reputable. They're gonna take the file off that and print it. Now, it is possible that they could have a virus on their computers and it could infect your USB. So it would be best to, um, before using that again, um, do a, uh, a reinitialization of the USB memory you can do that through File Manager. You can just go in and, and uh, initialize the USB uh, and, and clean everything out of it. So that's probably be the best thing to do if you do give it to some outside party to use. Um, accessing from through face or fingerprint. Is that safer? Um, 
Yeah, it is. Uh, the biometrics are safer than passwords for sure because um, they're unique. Uh, COVID was a problem with the facial recognition because everyone had a mask on. And so it's not perfect. And so that's why iPhones have the backup mechanism to enter your code. So they still do have a code, but um, yes, the biometrics are, are safer. Still two-factor authentication is better than just relying on that. Okay, I think that was all the questions. Paul, I have a couple of questions. So uh, can you say something about how people um, access your camera or your microphone without you knowing about it uh, mm. and what we can do for that? Well, a lot of my computers, I have a Band-Aid taped over the camera. <laughs> so, because I've, I've been, it, it may not be a malicious thing. You might be in a, uh, like a Zoom call or something and you don't want the camera on and all of a sudden it pops on. Um, because some of these programs allow, <clears throat> if you've engaged in the uh, relationship through the shared media, um, it, you like you were able to mute everyone, right? That's taking control of someone's microphone. You can also unmute people, you the host. So that's just a simple example. Programs like this allow you to take control of the, of the desktop. But the other way to do it is like in the case of Lower Marion, um, those computers were provisioned by the school district, by the IT people, uh, and they had the software built into those computers so they could remote access the computers and remote. Generally that's a, a a thing they would want to do anyway, so that if there's a problem with the computer, they can remotely get in there and fix it. But in this case, it was done. Um, but but it seems like people somehow uh, some hackers are able to. You you hear about the possibility. I don't know how often it's done, where they can actually have, you know, basically access at any point, any time that the computer or the phone is on. They can yeah. It's especially true with smart TVs that have a camera built into them because like I said, there's a default password that came from the manufacturer. It's the same for every TV of that vintage that's sold and the hackers know what it is. So they get in through your, you know, into your router and then they find the address of the TV, which generally identifies using the manufacturer name. So they see that's the TV. They know what type it is. And then they know, okay, for that TV, I can send, uh, a series of protocol messages that will allow me to authenticate and take control of the TV and do things like uh, remote turn on the camera. So all these features that are in hardware on these devices are accessible through software. And if you can authenticate as if you're a legitimate user of that device, you have access to the full machine. Okay. And then could you maybe say something just briefly about um international cybersecurity and attacks uh, from, you know, rogue nations or from terrorists or nefarious groups? Uh, well, a lot of the, a lot of these um, phishing attacks are from international sources. Part of that is because, um, you know, the U.S. government doesn't have jurisdiction. So if, if the attack was launched uh, within the U.S., the FBI could come down, you know, if they caught them, they could come down on them, uh, for violations of interstate commerce and things like that, throw them in jail for a very long time. So a lot of these attacks are coming from overseas where we don't have jurisdiction to prosecute. Um, that's unfortunate. So it, it, the only thing we can do is, you know, some of the tips I mentioned, like keeping your software up to date and patched and so forth and being vigilant about phishing attacks. Uh, you, we just have to be on the vanguard to uh, watch out for for that kind of behavior. Okay, and then how, how much are the laws up to date with regard to people that do uh, um, sort of cyber crime, uh, even in this country? Um, obviously it's harder when somebody's in a different country, but if somebody's in this country, they, they do something, you know, are laws, um, are there penal laws attached to all these things or we're still catching up with that? Well, some of both, um, a lot of cases, if it's theft, then the law will still prosecute for theft, whether it's done through cyber technology or otherwise, it's still, you know, at its root, it's theft. And um, so a lot of the law uh, still works uh, in this new medium. 
uh, but not always. There are, especially like cyberbullying, for example. Um, the laws have not caught up with that. Uh, all you can do is if there's a, an outcome that's quantifiable, you know, if someone hurts themselves because of cyberbullying, they might try to go after the people who did the bullying. But no, in some cases, the, the laws haven't caught up. And then I see um, Anne-Marie uh, says in the chat, can you talk about cookies? More and more I am asked to accept cookies and I'm not sure what an exception. Yeah, so that was a, a change in the law recently. Um, there, also in Europe, they have a, um, a very stringent um, privacy law about uh, not allowing companies to take your personal information without you making explicit um, acknowledgement they can do it. So one of the recent law changes related to cookies is uh, you have to uh, allow websites to um, basically embed the cookies in your browser. And generally cookies are not malicious things. They're just um, ways that if you go, for example, into Amazon, um, it can then remember that you're the person who signed into Amazon uh, the last time uh, and speed access to like your recent orders and things like that. So in general, cookies are just, it's metadata that gets associated with certain websites so that it speeds up browsing. But there are different gradients and um, when you're asked about cookies, you, you know, I mean, the, you can certainly say no. Um, in some cases, that won't allow that website to work properly, but in, you know, it should work in some fashion. Are they generally considered safe? Or they, I hear about cleaning cookies off your computer. Is there some way that that should be done, or is that really not necessary? I think it's it it's less of a cybersecurity issue um, and more of just good computer hygiene because computers get, if you will, gunked up with a lot of this stuff and they slow down. And so uh, clearing your browser cache, you know, some of the memory of where you browsed um, and cleaning cookies um, can help, you know, your performance. But they can also uh, do some things that like if you, if you don't accept the cookies or you don't, uh, if you clean them out, then things you take for granted, like you, you, like I said, you go to Amazon and it knows your account. Well, maybe you have to re-enter all of your um, information again and things like that. So it can make things a lot more tedious. So they're, they're shorthands. And generally the cookies, they're not one of the big exploits that um, comes up in the list of top 10 concerns. Okay. Any last questions, comments? Okay, not all. Wish everyone a happy moon. And, uh, Great, thank you very much. Uh, you're welcome. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much. It was very helpful. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks, Paul. Maybe we can have uh, Father Great Ephraim job. just uh, end us in prayer. And w welcome to Father Ephraim if, for any of those who uh, hasn't met him yet. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. Let us pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, we give you thanks for this counsel that we have received from your servant, Paul. We ask you to comfort us in a dangerous world. Give us wisdom to understand you. Counsel us Give us prudence in making decisions and help us to be knitted together by your spirit that we may be wise, caring, and that we may be a light to the world by all means that you provide for us in your church. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks so much, Paul, for all the time and effort you put into this. Very helpful. My pleasure. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night, everyone.